saying hi to you all and talking a little about uh, your self-identity, but I'm coming for another reason, just a quick announcement. Uh, a reminder again, my name is Mickey Estoesta. I'm a Campus Life Advisor in the Center for Student Leadership, Involvement, and Service, or the SLICE Office. We recognize clubs and organizations. Uh, but one thing that we are active in is promotion of healthy environments on our campus. And one of the, the months and weeks, I think you probably hear, we have a lot of awareness months or weeks on this campus. We like to do those things a lot around here. Um, but want to let you guys know about some upcoming events related to Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, obviously, sexual assault is a, is a topic or an issue that is very prevalent on college campuses um, and something that we do not want any Sonoma State students, however they are man, woman, sex, gender, it doesn't matter, that everyone should uh, be able to have a safe place. And we fully recognize that sexual assault is something that impacts many different entities and different groups. So we wanted to bring in different speakers, opportunities, um, ways to learn, to engage in conversation, and also to stand up and say that many, many students, so hopefully the large majority of all students on our campus, want this to be a safe campus. So I have a couple programs I want to let you all know about. I apologize for the short timeline. I was actually out last week at a conference, whether coming before or um, also it's no state, so we are slightly behind on planning. So, hey. Um, some things coming up though. One is actually tonight, Jacqueline Friedman is a nationwide speaker and she talks about how it's okay to have sex as long as you're doing it in a way that feels safe and healthy. Like, great, you're having sex, great, have fun, great. Um, and so she's doing a program in the ballroom and it's very interactive, this idea that you also, as an individual, have to know what you want before that you can ask someone else what they want. Um, and that's somewhat tied to our surgeon's training, that's a much smaller program in the hub. Uh, the 14th, 15th, that's tomorrow. So this idea of once you know what you want, how do you ask for it? And then how do you also listen to other people to make sure that in your relationships, whether it's a friendly Friday night relationship or a long-term whatever relationship, as you so define it, um, that you're able to have healthy relationships. So that's what that program is. Another program we're super excited about, it's next week, it's called Bro Code. Um, often I'm sure we have some men in this room who probably are incredibly frustrated by the often uh, stigmas that surround this idea that all men are rapists, um, and that can be incredibly frustrating and daunting probably to hear. Um, and so this is a program that really talks about masculinity and how current male culture influences, for better and for worse, um, how sexual assault is perceived and how it actually happens um, across the country. Um, have any of y'all heard of the movie The Hunting Ground? Does that sound familiar to you all? It's a, some of y'all have heard it? Um, it's this amazing movie, um, documentary, that really is looking at sexual assault on campus now. And so it interviews students who have taken Title IX investigations for the federal court. It, it looks at um, Florida State. It looks at fraternities. It looks at different college campuses. It looks how students are either supported or not when these things happen. Um, it's just come out. It's actually come out in, in theaters. You can go see it in Berkeley or at the Embarcadero in the city. But we were able to bring it to campus to have a screening for you all. I'm very excited about this. It's a really great way to look about how this is being handled across the entire country, especially from a college context. Um, Denim Day, anybody know what that is? No? So this is the easiest way to get involved in Georgia Court. Denim Day is a day where we want everyone to wear denim. It actually came from a court case in Italy where a woman um, reported that she was sexually assaulted and the judge said that because she was wearing jeans that were tight, there's no way that she didn't willingly do that because she couldn't got, have gotten her jeans off herself which is so not okay. Um, and so the denim day is to say that no matter what you wear, it doesn't mean you're asking for it, and it means that you deserve the right to be in a safe environment. So if you just want to wear denim, come by Seawolf Plaza and get a big sticker about denim day. Um, to kind of show an easy way, um, kind of a more passive way to show that everyone, no matter what they're wearing and how to present themselves, deserves to be safe. And the final program is Take Back the Night. This is an incredible, incredible program. It happens all the way across the country. It's a place where just to kind of say that like where we want to go and how we are supporting people. It allows people to share their personal stories and we actually do a walk around campus to say that this is still our campus and we deserve and we should feel safe where we are. So it's a very cool thing to kind of bring everyone together. Um, it's in the evening, um, starting up at the ballroom and kind of to allow people a, a safe place to talk and share and also to support others. So we're very excited about all these programs. Um, they really kind of, you can go to whatever hits you personally. You can be as involved or not involved in these, but wanted to just kind of let you guys know about um, how campus is kind of looking at this issue and providing some forums for people to, to talk and to learn some more. Are there any questions? Yes, Are these events on the website? Probably not. Uh, but I believe I sent this to Alvin. I can send it out.
and Alvin will send it to you all. If you guys do go on the Slice uh, Facebook page, I believe that's all up there, or on OrcSync, you can log in there and just find them all up there. Too. Anything else? All right. Thank you all for having me. Have a lovely Tuesday. Okay, I have one more quick announcement before our presenter joins us here. So, we are looking for more candidates for some of our leadership positions. So, I thought, naturally, being that University 238 is a requirement for these leadership positions, that I would let you all know first that you can have the opportunity to apply if you haven't already done so. Okay, so three positions. Four, three. Three positions. First is summer orientation leaders. They are looking for more candidates. ITP actors looking for more candidates. Stretch peer mentors looking for more candidates. And humanities learning communities peer mentors looking for more candidates. So what does that mean? That means that Alvin has some pieces of paper up here that you will come to at the end of class and you will write your name and email and let me know that you're interested in those positions. We ask that you only put your name down if you're interested in that position if you haven't already applied for that position. So if you're already given an alternate or maybe you were not offered the position, um, please don't put your name down on there. It just means that maybe there's another position that you haven't already applied to that might be a better fit for you, okay? So at the end of class, come on up, put your name and email down, and the hiring managers for those positions will reach out to you and let you know what the next steps are going to be. Cool? All right, I'll remind you at the end of class, too. Bobby, you're here. All righty, so um, before I introduce our great speaker today, I wanted to just talk about a little bit about your expectations here in lecture. So we expect that you don't have your cell phones on and that you don't talk to your friends while you're here. Your friends won't die without you for one hour, all right? You're not here that long. Also, the other thing is, please be engaged, pay attention, you know, don't be looking around at the stars because there's no stars because we're in a building. And, <laughs> and the other thing is also to please not leave early unless you've arranged with your TA to leave early because, you know, it's, you're here for at least 15 minutes. Just sit down, relax, and enjoy the presentation. All the speakers have so much to offer to you that it's important that you stay, all right? So now, without further ado, our speaker today is Dr. Kim Hester Williams. She is a professor in the English and American Multicultural Studies Department. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hester Williams. First of all, thank you for the invitation. Alvin, thank you very much for this invitation. I wasn't quite sure what this class was about, but a couple of my students, um, Sasha and Joy, who are here, uh, gave me some information, and I appreciate having a little bit more context. Uh, I will say that I am not, uh, before I say who I am and sort of what my background is, I am definitely not a, a person who trains leaders, and I don't have the, the sort of technical, theoretical, um, you know, uh, background and grounding in that, in that discipline, and it is a discipline, and it's, a, it's an important one. Um, oh, good. The projection. Sometimes it happens and things go wrong. Um, I'm sorry, can I speak up? Wow, that's the first time I've ever heard that because I'm super loud. It's usually the opposite. Oh, yes, good. It sounds good. Sounds good. Um, okay, so, um, so uh, can you hear me now? Good, okay. So I am uh, an arts person, I'm not a social scientist. I, I'm a person who works in art, arts and humanities. Um, with, I know many of you are familiar with that. And I, I will be approaching uh, the idea, the concept uh, of leadership from that perspective as an arts, not only as an arts professor, a literature professor, but also as of myself, a poet and artist. So you'll hear lots of poetry today, uh, at least some, and see, and see some art. So I'm gonna click off of this because we're not we're not ready for that yet. And I'm going to make my announcements, my, my formal sort of introduction, and then we'll... Um, so how do I put this on um, 
like make the screen disappear because I don't want one. Do what? Pull the cord out? Is that going to mess things up? Okay. Because I, I, what I'm going to do now is, is talk for a little bit and then I'll have the PowerPoint. Okay. I'm going to do that. I'm going to take out the suggestion. Pull the cord out. All right. All right. <laughs> I'll make do. Um, so the, um, this, the title of my talk today is, and I'll, you, it will be projected later so you don't have to take a lot of notes, you don't have to write this down, but the title of my talk today is What is to be done? Social justice and fostering an ethics of communal connection and responsibility in arts and humanities leadership. So I want to keep my comments brief and make sure to leave time for your questions and comments as well as concerns and your responses to this presentation, of course. Um, I'd like it and I think it's most useful if we can have a chance to interact, uh, to hear what you're thinking about uh, as far as your own leadership goals and process of becoming, um, if you will, a leader. Um, I'm interested to know what you think comprises a good leader. Not what I think, but what you think comprises a good leader and good leadership. Uh, that's as important as what I have to share with you today. So you should feel empowered in this space, especially to ask any questions uh, that are on your mind and to really explore the issues that most concern you. And I will say there's a test at the end because you've been here for many weeks learning about leadership. So I think there's probably more that you can teach me than what I can teach you. So I want to ask for your help. And that is what the, the function of the test later is for me to ask your help and your, um, your um, critically grounded, informed opinion about leadership. So I've already said that I'm a, I'm a literature professor and that um, I don't have any technical advice or definitions. Um, I certainly can engage you in a rhetorical discourse analysis of the terms leader and leadership. For example, from the dictionary, quote, a person who commands a group or organization, a person who leads, guides, or conducts. I especially like conducts here as a musical metaphor, going back to the art. I think that's productive, and we uh, could talk, and, and we'll talk a little bit more at the end about the use of the metaphor conducts um, in defining a good leader. Um, but now I'd like to take a slightly different approach or move away from that just for a few minutes. Um, so I'm going to use as an anecdotal example my own trajectory from graduate school to full professor. Um, one of the first lessons of going to graduate school is to be as resourceful as you can and to take full advantage of the opportunities afforded to you. Um, one opportunity is this weekend, this Saturday, is the California Diversity Forum for Graduate Education. How many people have heard of that? And how many people plan on attending? Uh, have registered to attend, okay, just a couple people. So that, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can look it up later, but uh, this is a forum that uh, promotes encourages and essentially recruits uh, uh, students from underrepresented communities to go to graduate school, to earn master's degrees, PhDs, and professional degrees, law school, et cetera. And that's held at various universities throughout the uh, state. And North, there's a Northern California branch and a Southern California branch. And the Northern California branch of this organization is holding the conference, uh, the forum here at Sonoma State University on Saturday. So that's a, a really wonderful opportunity to um, think about going to graduate school and to work on your leadership skills. Um, so um, basically, I, I want to emphasize that leaders don't simply sit back and wait for the answers. Right? Effective leaders um, formulate the questions. They, leaders are people who um, come up with the questions that need to be answered. And that's the gist of my talk today. That's the central point that I want to make and that I want to leave you with. Um, I made it from graduate school, um, and it was difficult. Uh, my biggest deficit was that I lacked confidence. That's the other thing that I, I'm sure you all realize. Leaders need to be confident, uh, to exude confidence. Um, to be comfortable 
uh, with their um, body of knowledge and with the contributions that they know that they can make. Um, even though I never really felt like I belonged at, for instance, UC Santa Cruz, which is where I received my bachelor's degree, um, and I was a minority quite literally in my program, and I felt scrutinized heavily, um, I survived. Um, that, that paralysis that I felt often, um, that I can't do this, um, I, I struggled through that feeling and that paralysis and I was able to persevere. And that is what I think comprises good leadership and good leaders. Um, how did I do this? I realized that I had something to offer to the conversation that was central, not only to my life, but to the lives of others. In short, to my community. Community is what a leader <coughs> conducts, facilitates, nurtures, and protects, quite vigorously and fearlessly. Campus community, family community, local and global community, and species being community, meaning not just human beings, but all living creatures of the earth and the earth itself. And we know that there is a crisis. There is a crisis about our relationship to the earth, to other species beings. And that if we don't solve this crisis, we will be like the Macedon, as um, Maya Angelou said in her, um, uh, when she gave the inaugural poem when President Clinton was inaugurated. She talked about extinction in her poem and what it meant for human beings to take lessons um, about extinction. What are, the, what are the choices that need to be made? The hard choices that need to be made. I'll mention this because I'm on my soapbox about this so much water in California. Hard choices need to be made about our relationship to the land, to the earth, what we've taken and what we know we can't give back. We can't, we can't get back what we've taken. How can we uh, replenish it? How can we rejuvenate it? How can we give back as opposed to just simply taking something that's limited, that we know is a limited resource? So leaders are the ones that think about the questions that need to be answered. And that's just one example. Um, all right, so, um, brings me to my main approach, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hope this works now. I hope it's true. It's gonna come back on. And I don't have to, uh... I think it is. It looks like it's thinking of doing something. Okay, there it is. So, nice! It's really nice when the technology actually works. There's so many conferences where it doesn't. Um, so, Foundations of Leadership is the, the title of this course, and here again, my title, What is to be Done? This is my approach to the question of leadership. Social justice and fostering, again, an ethics of communal connection and responsibility in arts and humanities. My AMCS 260 course, which is arts in, um, um, which is ethnicity. Arts, media, what is it? Arts, media, I'm just art on the arts and media, culture, arts, media, and culture. <laughs> I can't stand that title because I never remember it so long, but art, right? Um, and certainly media. So here's a cover of a book that came out um, a couple of years ago. It's a very fascinating book. It's an anthology. The, the subtitle is An Anthology of American Violence. Uh, the main title is Killing Trayvons, and I see another person in the audience who I, I won't, uh, I won't, uh, well, obviously I am going to actually identify him when I say what I'm going to say. So forgive me, Malik, at the end, you can be mad at me. Um, but I, uh, how many people saw Facing Our Truth? The play, the play that, that was uh, performed here at Sonoma State last, in March. And, um, we, when the crew was um, sort of debriefing and talking about our experiences 
In the play, I was a guest director of the play Dressing, which is the one where the mother is lamenting the loss, the killing of her son um, for wearing a hoodie and he's killed. And the hoodie is a, a, a recurrent theme and symbol throughout those 10 plays, uh, the six 10 minute plays, excuse me. Um, one of the things I didn't share, Malik, is that, and I didn't share it because I, I felt that I would be too emotionally, that I wouldn't be able to hold myself together. And it really goes again to the heart of this talk. And that is that one of the, we were asked like, what was one of the most poignant moments for you as a cast member and a person involved in these plays about Trayvon Martin re reading that, um, that whole incident and tragedy. Um, and I realized that actually the most poignant moment in the Facing Our Truth plays um, about Trayvon and race and privilege was when Malik was in the play, The Ballad of George Zimmerman, and he was Trayvon Martin. So if you went to the plays, you already know that. And actually one of the moments that was most powerful and moving for me, the most powerful and moving moment, it's the only play of the six plays where Trayvon is actually in the play, um, is when Malik playing Trayvon is singing, beautifully singing, you know, trying to figure out what's going on in this encounter, if you will. And then all of a sudden, he says, help, 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 help. And then he's gone. He lays down because he's obviously been shot and killed by George Zimmerman. That was the most powerful, emotionally wrenching moment for me of those plays. And that, that, I thought about it a lot, really. help, 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 help. That's what we need. The environment needs help. This question of racial violence and inequality needs help. Economic inequality, right? Tomorrow, April 15th, what's gonna happen? If you don't know, I feel really sad that you don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. Someone in the orange shirt knows because they're shaking their hand in affirmation. Tell, stand up and tell everyone what's going to happen tomorrow. On April 15th, which is also tax day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We need a new, but tell us what's going to happen tomorrow. Tell us about the campaign tomorrow. <laughs> Seriously, tomorrow is going to be an action day. We've had so many, but it's going to be a workers' action day. Well, a workers' action day where workers are going to stand up all over this nation. Right? I don't know if it extends beyond our national borders. And they're going to protest, they are going to picket, right? Um, the last days of Martin Luther King Jr.'s life were spent with a poor people's campaign, with a jobs campaign, with the garbage man strike in Memphis. Remember that? So tomorrow, there's going to be an action, right, where workers who are um, not being paid sufficiently are going to stand up for a higher minimum wage. Like that's one basic demand that they're going to make. And you'll hear about it all, if you, if you hear, watch the news, you will be really, they're going to make it very visible. This struggle for economic justice, not just in equality, because that gets slippery. Economic justice, right? Help. Help. That's what leaders do. Leaders don't just lead, they help. And that's what we need. So I, I'm sorry to lay it on heavy today. And I thought about it, and I said, I should go in there and do some jokes. I dance, Susan, so I like to dance. But I can't. I can't do that. Things are too urgent. Killing Trayvons. Not just Trayvon Martin, but over and over and over again, the racial violence seems as though it has no end. And I should say racial and economic violence because that's what Martin Luther King Jr. understood at the end of his life, that there was a direct correlation between racial and economic violence. 
and inequality. So here's a poem from that anthology, an anthology of American violence, and I'm going to read it to you. It's by Rita Dove, who's another um, Amer uh, U.S. poet uh, laureate. She was a poet laureate of our nation years ago. And she wrote a poem for this collection called Trayvon Redux, which is what I just said, right? It keeps repeating. It keeps coming back. Help. <clears throat> Starts with an epigraph from William Carlos Williams. It is difficult to get the news from poems. Yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found in them. Hear me out, for I too am concerned. And every man who wants to die at peace in his bed for science. That's William Carlos Williams. Ask for them that green flower. Move along, you don't belong here. This is what you're thinking. Thinking drives you nuts these days. All that talk about rights and law abidance when you can't even walk in your own neighborhood in peace and quiet. Get your black ass gone. You're thinking again. Then what? Matlock's on TV and here you are, vigilant, weary, exposed to the elements on a wet winter's evening in Florida when all's not right, but no one sees it. Well, where are they? Where are they? The law, the enforcers, blind as a bunch of lazy bats can be, holsters dangling from coat hooks above their desks as they jaw the news for clean donuts. Hey, it tastes good. Shoving your voice down the throat, thinking only of sweetness. Go on, choke on that. Did you say something? Are you thinking again? Stop! And get your ass gone, your blackness, that casual little red riding hood. I'm just on my way home, attitude. As if this street was his to walk on. Do you hear me talking to you, boy? How dare he smile, jingling his goodies in that tiny, shiny bag, his black paw crinkling it. How dare he tinkle their laughter at me. Here's a fine basket of riddles. If a mouth shoots off and no one's around to hear it, who can say which came first? Push or shove, bang or whimper. Which is news fit to write home about? Questions. We need questions. We need answers. We need to figure out how to live in community, how to survive. Um, so this is just a little bit about me, and I'm not going to really go, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time, I was going to talk more about this, but I will go down to say that um, uh, I recently, last uh, year, my essay, Fix My Life, Oprah Post-Racial Economic Dispossession and the Precious Transforma Transformation of Push, was published in um, the journal Cultural Dynamics, and in that, in that essay, academic essay, I talk a lot about the film Push, how many people saw the film, um, or Precious, the book, the, not, the book is called Push, was titled Push by Sapphire, and then the film adaptation was um, Precious. How many people saw Precious? Raise your hand. So I basically talk about the way in which that film um, was um, translated to film, and basically transfigured, and some of the messages of that Sapphire originally had in the novel Push were lost, and lost, certainly lost upon uh, film audiences. Um, I do a lot in cultural studies, women and gender studies, and I, I talk about the representation of race, gender, and economy in the media and popular culture, literature, and film. 
And so I really wanted to think about the welfare, question of welfare that's at the center of that narrative and how the economic <coughs> violence gets lost in the film and in the film adaptation. Uh, Sapphire takes great pains and is very meticulous about thinking about how uh, we do or do not take care of each other as a community um, and the, the economic system that, again, um, exacts so much violence on workers and on poor people. Um, so I just emphasize that that's part of, um, I want us to see that in the context of the larger anthology of American violence from that killing uh, Trayvon's um, book, powerful book. Highly recommend it if you don't have it, haven't read it. So arts and humanities and social justice, how do we think about leadership and social justice as an artist, scholar, and teacher for me? Uh, what is the role of art as a scientist? If, you're a sci if you work in the field of science, that's really important to think about the role of science and technology as well uh, in social justice. Uh, what is the role of art in social justice and leadership? How can art transform society through leadership? So here are some questions that I begin with in my AMCS 260 class, which is Ethnicity and Arts, Media, and Culture. There's the title right there. Why do so many people in the United States, as well as abroad, know these names? I began the class uh, asking my students this. Amadou Diallo, Alan Uper, right here in the Bay Area, Trayvon Martin, Oscar Grant, Renisha McBride, Andy Lopez, again in this uh, Sonoma, Santa Rosa area, Michael Brown, Eric Garner. How about the, 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 the numerous other names that you may not have heard of? Alicia Thomas, Jordan Davis, Melissa Alexander, Kelly Thomas, or Yanira Serino, uh, Serrano, excuse me, Garcia. Ayanna Stanley Jones, Timothy Russell, Melissa Williams. How about Tamir Rice? Or more recently, last week, Walter Scott in Charleston, South Carolina. It goes on and on and on. Redux. Why has so much national and international attention been fixated on these names? What is this hashtag Black Lives Matter business all about, really? Um, so, um, here I have um, what I want to present, sort of my approach to the problem, because that's right here, this is the problem. Anti-racism versus U.S. antagonisms. I take U.S. antagonisms from a book by Frank B. Wilderson called Red, White, and Black, Cinema and the Structure of U.S. Antagonisms. And in the uh, initial chapter, Unspeakable Ethics, he has a quote, and he talks about this. There is a quote unquote triangulation between two things. The loss of one's body, right? death, what I like to call black death. The very dereliction of corporeal integrity, what Hortense Spillers charts as the transition from being to becoming a quote unquote being for the capital. And here he is asking me to think about slavery, specifically US slavery. The drama of value. What do we value? What bodies do we value? How do we value them? Why, in some cases, don't we value certain bodies? On the other, the corporeal integrity that once ripped from one's body, and again, that scene in Facing Our Truth in the Battle of George Zimmerman when Trayvon is gone. Fortified and extended the corporeal value of everyone else. Meaning to translate what Wilderson is saying, that once a certain body, and I might even think here on the level of animals, is devalued, that provides added value for the bodies that are left. But when they come for me and I'm gone, they'll come for someone else, and that person will be gone. I wish it was something more pleasant, like Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, right, so, right, the, the bodies will keep going down, just like Trayvon goes down in the play in real life. They will come for another body, and they will keep coming 
until all the bodies are gone. What is to be done? That is a question for me of leadership. Um, African Americans are overrepresented, as we all know, in 2015 in the criminal justice system and the prison population. Who else? Black and brown bodies overrepresented. Poor people overrepresented. Overrepresented and often falsely in the media. Film, television, music, video games. Watch some video games and see how many people of color are in them a lot and what they're doing. That's, that's, there's a lot of representation there, but it's often racial, racially biased. People who want to design video games, and I have a couple of uh, nephews and a niece who wants to do that, is training to do that, work on video games. I would say we need good leadership there, good role modeling there. Um, Overrepresented in the exploitative arena of both professional and collegiate athletics. Are there athletes, right? Um, NCAA athletes who are saying, we need a union. Because we're not just students, and we're not just student athletes, as they want to say, NCAA. We are workers, and we're making lots and lots of money and profit for these institutions, right? It's a struggle afoot there. Overrepresented in health disparities, as you all, I'm sure, know. Diabetes, high blood pressure, infant mortality rates. Underrepresented in education, science, technology, politics. Yes, yes, even with Obama. <laughs> Still underrepresented and misrepresented. What is to be done? So I am going to uh, end my formal portion. I have no idea what time. Oh, there it is. Uh, with this, I want to begin the poetry, end with the poetry. And one short clip that I want to show you from YouTube. This is an epigraph to uh, this uh, paper that I'm giving next week. That's what it says there, that for portion. This is a poem left by Nikki Finney, and she wrote this poem uh, about the Katrina earthquake, the, the hurricane, hurricane Katrina, um, the devastation left by Hurricane Katrina. People who outlive bullwhips and bull Connor Historically afraid of water and routinely fed to crocodiles, left in the sun on the sticky tar heap of roofs to roast by pigs, surrounded by 40 feet of churning water in the summer of 2005, while the richest country in the world played the old observation game, studied the situation, wondered by committee what to do, counted in private by long historical division, speculated whether or not some people are surely born ready, accustomed to flood, famine, fear. Final questions as we ponder that redux of racial violence. What kind of creative problem solving can we apply to this social justice issue, specifically racial violence, social, political, and economic inequality? <coughs> Campaign tomorrow for a living wage will happen. So uh, here are, to end, some examples that I can use of that. The hashtag Black Lives Matter are full of leaders and leadership, creative leadership. Black millennials dealing with the Ferguson, look at what they accomplished, those young 20-something people. A report 
a federal report about all the injustices over a long historical period that Ferguson wasn't just Michael Brown. It was something that had been going on for a long time, was deeply ingrained in that culture and these 20-somethings. Applied creative leadership. They got out there and they didn't ride on the laurels of the civil rights movement of the past. But they created a new movement, new questions, and new answers, new solutions. So last but not least, I want to show you this Broadway artist's response to the killing of Eric Garner. And it is titled, I Can't Believe, which is what we heard him say. I don't know if it's going to come on. What does it say? Cannot locate. I don't know what that means. Oh boy. I don't know if it's going to play because I don't. Oh, yeah, that's right. Let me, let me see if I can do it that way. I'll just do it. Let me see if I can do it that way. Let's see if it'll play. Yeah. Okay, so it's loading. And this is what they decided to do as artists. Broadway, you know, Broadway. Lion King and all, okay, it's not gonna play. I think it's the internet. It's the internet, when we unplug it, I think the internet. So I, I, I can have Alvin send you the link so that you can, it's very powerful, their poem. It's another poem, a poetic response. Uh, in front of the New York police uh, station, the NYPD um, station, uh, protesting uh, the killing of Eric Garner. So I guess what I'll do, uh, given the fact that this is just not going to play, uh, is unplug it, because I don't want to say any more about this. And I will actually give you my last slide, because that's not my, my last slide. I'll go back to this. And I'll... Um, show you the last slide. Which is this. This is the test that I told you about. What do you think are the most important questions that we need to formulate around this issue? How do we successfully address these questions What's the next step? How can we, and I actually mean you, we all together as a community, fix this, what I think is undeniably a problem? How can we fix it together as leaders and not people who are passive and who just sort of let the earth go to its demise and all of us go with it? So I am, there's a couple minutes left, I think, and I'm certainly happy for you to answer these questions or uh, ask direct questions of me or just make comments. Who, who was the person that was there? They left, right? There was another person. No, you didn't. You're right there. I would like you to finish it. Because you, you say everything that you, you can re it resonates with you. I hope you do. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I know you will. Questions, comments? I have to ask this one, Alvin, before I leave.
because it's burning. I'm giving a talk next week about this that's going to be even more forceful than you can imagine. It's just black death. It's called black death. We're going to talk about next week. But how many people don't actually think we have a problem with racial profiling, brutality, overrepresentation in the criminal justice? How many people, raise your hand if you're like, I'm serious, because I, I, I don't want it to be a one sided. How many, raise your hand if we do not have a problem? This is a good society, and people should just follow the law, and they'll be all right. <laughs> um, I believe that it's people who close their eyes and say, I'm satisfied with my life because I don't see it, therefore it's not happening. And that's not, and I thank you so much. I, I, and that's not to say that there aren't good, some of the, the leadership we need is actually in law enforcement. And there are the good leaders there. There are people right now as we speak working on this problem trying to figure out how to stop. You see the man last week, the police officer? Totally arrested. Look how far we've come to where now it's like we can't have a blind eye anymore. Hey, wait, no, you're putting it. No, you've got to. Now, and I don't think the criminal justice system myself is a solution. I don't think putting more people in prison is actually a solution to our, to the problem, the problem that you're talking about. I don't think that's, we just don't have enough prison space. It's not an effective place to, to deal with this issue. You will decide. And some of you may go on to work in law enforcement, and I hope you do. I hope that you do. It's what we need. Help. I guess I'm not.